This evening we're going to be uh, looking at John chapter 14 as well as several other verses in Scripture. But what I'd like to do is begin by reading John 14 verses 21 through 24. John chapter 14, verses 21 through 24. Uh, This is what Jesus says. And again, I start in verse 21 because he says very clearly what he's also going to say in verses 23 and 24. And this is what the Lord would have us to examine our hearts by this evening. He says this, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and will disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. The word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. May the Lord bless his word to help us this evening, uh, to see ourselves, to see where we're at, and to encourage us uh, to seek the Lord for more of his spirit, that we may love him more, obey him more, devote ourselves more to him, in other words, be more holy, This certainly fits quite well with what we've been seeing um, in the morning sermons as well. Now again, just by way of reminder, we have seen from Psalm 119 many reasons why we should study God's law, uh, why we should apply it to our lives. And most of these had to do with positive blessings, uh, blessings of protection against our enemies, and we need that. Uh, We may not have so many physical enemies, although sometimes we do, but we certainly have spiritual enemies, not the least of which is our own flesh, which is seeking to drag us down, seeking to pull us into the world. We have the world, which is an enemy to us as well, that's trying to distract us and get us to get our attention off of the Lord and onto things that will do us no good at all. And of course, there is the enemy of our souls who seeks to destroy everything that the Lord is doing. We do need protection. So those are reasons, of course, uh, why we should obey God's law. But there are other reasons. Uh, Last week we saw two that were perhaps more on the negative side uh, that should provide us a very strong motivation uh, not to allow even one sin, as much as one sin, in our lives. The first reason we saw was that even one sin deserves eternal damnation. And the second reason was that even one sin can destroy you forever. Now again, the first reason was to remind you that even though the Lord has forgiven you all of your sins, every single one of them, uh, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you should never allow that fact to make you see sin as anything other than what it is. Sins, every single sin is a crime against God, a crime that if we got what we deserve, we would get everlasting punishment. You see, but for God's grace, not only would it condemn us, but every single sin we commit would weigh us down further and further into hell forever. We need to remember that that is the character of sin and that we never see it other than what it is, even though the Lord has forgiven us. In other words, we don't use his grace as an excuse to sin. Now the second uh, reason was to remind you that if Jesus Christ really has freed you from sin, that he has set you free from all sin, from every sin, not just some, and that you will fight against every sin, not just some, and you will try to do all that he commands, not just part of what he commands. The Spirit that He gives you, the Holy Spirit, will move you to love and to do everything that is good. And of course, since He's moving you in that direction, it will at the same time cause you to fight against everything that isn't good. If that fight isn't going on in your life, 
It's because the spirit isn't there. That's why if you allow yourself to practice even one sin and you're not struggling against it at all, it means the spirit of God is not in you because if he was, he would be moving you towards what is good and you would hate that sin and you would fight against it. Now again, both of these provide very good reasons why even one sin is, is one sin too many. But, of course, there are many other reasons, what we might call positive reasons, why we shouldn't allow even one sin in our lives. And tonight I'd like us, for us to look at one that I think will be especially helpful as we prepare to come to the Lord's table. And that's what Jesus says with regard to how we measure our love for Him. And that, of course, is by our obedience. He says in our text, again, I'll read for you, John 14, verses 23 and 24. If anyone loves me, he will keep my words. I don't see any uncertainty about that. I, I hope you don't either. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. How can you measure your love for Jesus? Jesus says you can do it really in only one way, and that is through your obedience. The more you love him, the more you will obey. The less you love him, the less you will obey. And of course, those who don't love him at all, aren't going to obey at all. So I do want us to see one thing. And here's, here's the distinction that I'm making in this particular sermon versus the other sermons that talk about how we should love God's law. I mean, Jesus is telling us not just that we need to love the law of God. He tells us if we love him, we will actually obey it. And there really is a big difference between those two things. So what I'd like for us to look at tonight is how Jesus says you can measure your love for him. And then we're going to spend a few minutes actually measuring our love by his standard. So first of all, Jesus tells you how you can measure your love for him. Well, how do you usually measure your love for Jesus Christ? If you do it differently than Jesus tells you, then you really need to rethink your methodology. You need to rethink your standard. You need to use another ruler. Now, let me just suggest some of the ways perhaps that we might ordinarily do this. Do you measure your love for him by the amount of time that you spend with him in your devotions? You know, the, the more time you read the Bible, the more time you pray, the more you love him. Uh, do you gauge it by how well you understand what the Bible teaches, the fact that you, you, you know more about the Bible, even the fact that you agree with it? Or, um, you know, is, is, it, is it a matter of the more you know, the more you understand, the more you love him? Uh, do you evaluate it by how much you attend church? How much you really enjoy singing uh, the songs that we sing here? How much you enjoy listening to the Word of God preached? Is that how you measure it? Or uh, do you, perhaps, I think this might be more common, make your assessment by how you feel about Jesus? You know, I, I feel sort of warm inside when I hear His name mentioned. Uh, I, when I think about Him, you know, it, I, it, it draws my heart out to Him. Or maybe when the cross is presented and I understand how much Jesus loved me and laid, you know, gave his life for me, that it causes me to shed a tear. Do you measure your love by how many tears you shed when you hear about the cross? Now, let me just say that if you love Jesus, you know, of course you're going to do all these things. I mean, you can hardly claim to love Jesus if you don't read the word that he actually addressed to you if you don't spend time with him, you know, seeking him in prayer, talking with him and letting him talk to you through his word, if you don't try to understand everything that he tells you in his word, if you don't want to attend church or have fellowship with the saints, every time you have the opportunity, or if you don't feel any love in your heart at all towards him, or if his cross has never actually elicited even one tear from your eyes. I mean, if these things aren't true of you, you can hardly claim to love Jesus Christ. But the question I'm asking is, are these things enough to prove 
that you really do love him? Well, I draw your attention to the Pharisees. You know, one look at the Pharisees, Pharisees should be enough to convince you that you can do all these things and still really not love Jesus Christ because who read and studied God's word more than the Pharisees? You know, the scribes, the lawyers were the ones who, who copied the word of God. They were experts in the law. They had memorized large portions of scripture. Just read the scriptures to see how much time they spent in prayer and how they loved to go to the synagogues to worship. And certainly above everyone else, they claimed to love God. But still there was something missing. Well, what was missing in the lives of the Pharisees? Well, lots of things, but two in particular. First of all, they were very selective in their obedience. They obeyed perhaps some of the commandments, but conveniently left other commandments out. Uh, Jesus says to them in Matthew 23, verses 23 and 24, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. You see, they obeyed, but they only obeyed part of God's word, only the parts that seemed to um, maybe reflect well on them, but they left out the more difficult, the weightier things, the things that were far more important. But the second problem was this, that even when they did obey, they weren't doing it out of love for God, they weren't doing it uh, because they wanted to glorify Him, they were doing it for themselves because of how it would make them look. Again, Jesus says, in Matthew 15, I believe this is, verses 5 through 7. But they do their deeds to be noticed by men. For they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues. Actually, I think this is in chapter 23. And respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. I mean, whose honor did they have in view here? And then in Matthew 15, verses 8 through 9, Jesus says again to them, You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Oh, well, they put up a good show. You know, they, they looked righteous. They, they even did some of the right things. But the fact that they were doing these things did not prove that they loved God. It wasn't enough. Now, how does Jesus tell you that you are to measure your love? Well, again, John 14, verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Isn't that simple, isn't it? So simple. And yet, not quite so easy to do, but... To the degree that we love him, to the degree we'll do this. And then he says the same thing in verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. Now, if you love Jesus Christ, how many of these commandments will you keep? You will keep all of them. And you will do it because you love him. Now, just thinking back again to the things that I mentioned earlier as the things that we usually think of as ways by which we know that we love Jesus Christ, spending time with Him, praying, reading His Word, trying to understand it, attending worship, and so forth. Why do you do these things in the first place? I mean, what's your purpose behind it? Well, certainly it is that you want to get to know God. That's one thing. But isn't it so that you might gain from the Lord more strength, more power, to love him. And why is it that you want more strength? Why do you want more love? I mean, what's your purpose behind that? Isn't it that you might better be able to obey him? Isn't that why you read the word of God? Is not only to get to know God, but knowing him, to know how to please him, to know how to honor him, to know how to love him. Well, that's why you should be doing these things. These in, in and of themselves can be an act of love, but they don't go far enough unless you actually take what you've learned and put it into practice. You see, obeying Jesus 
is where the rubber meets the road. And that's one of the main reasons why we've been you know, spending so much time looking at the commandments, trying to understand the commandments. It wasn't just so that we could know what they say. It wasn't just so that we would be able to teach our children or to teach other people what these things mean in a Bible study. It was so that we would know better how to love Jesus Christ. And again, John 14, verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my word. So here's the principle, okay? Here's, here's the thing that we need to see. If we love Jesus Christ, it's not just a matter of what we feel about him in our hearts. It's not just a matter of certain acts of piety and devotion. It is a matter of obedience to all of his word. If we love him, if we love his word, if we love righteousness, if we have the Holy Spirit within us, we will want to do all that he calls us to do. So with this in view, uh, let me give you a test. And by the way, as I'm giving you this, I've already tested myself and, and I already know the state of my own heart. But let me give you the opportunity to give, you know, to measure your own love by the standard Jesus tells you to use his commandments. And remember that this isn't a test merely to determine whether you understand the commandment or you agree with it or even love it but whether or not you're practicing it, whether or not you're obeying it, because that is how you demonstrate your love for Jesus Christ. So first of all, using the commandments, let's test your love for God more directly through the first four commandments. So ask yourself these questions. And by the way, there's a lot of applications to the law of God. I've only chosen just a couple because there are areas I think that we all struggle with and perhaps are the main idea behind the commandments. Let me ask you this first. Is there anything in this world or anyone that you love more than God? You know, the amount of time that you devote to things or to individuals is a good indicator of just how much you love that thing or that person. So if you love God the most, you'll spend most of your time with him. Now, do you spend most of your time with him? Do you, do you think about him often? Do you try to please him in everything that you do? I mean, when you're faced with a decision, do you think about how your choice is going to either please him or displease him according to his word? Do you try to do that in, in everything you think, in everything you say, in every decision? Jesus, well, actually the Lord tells us in Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. And do you realize anything you love more than God is putting somebody before him? You must love him the most. That's what the first commandment is about. Now, the second question I have really is an overlap between the first and the second commandment. It has to do with worship. Do you really enjoy coming to church and worshiping God in the way that that we do here. You know, we, we're not the entertainment-driven church, as you can see, where although the people of God will find what we're doing, I think, to be entertaining but in the right way. But do you enjoy worshiping God in the way that He commands that you worship Him? Do you enjoy singing psalms? Do you enjoy singing hymns and spiritual songs? Do you enjoy hearing His Word read and preach? I mean, are you enjoying this? Do you enjoy praying? fellowshipping with God's people. Uh, when his people meet together on God's holy day, do you meet with them and do you enjoy that? And if the Lord provides two opportunities for you to meet with him on his day, do you want to do that? Do you want to meet with him twice? Or in your estimation, is that a work of super arrogation above and beyond your duty that's really an optional thing? Well, if you love the Lord, where else in the world would you rather be? when his people are gathering together to worship. And what about the midweek study? Do you enjoy the midweek study? Do you enjoy seeking the Lord together in prayer? See, all these things are wrapped up in the first and second commandments. In Exodus 20, verses four through six, 
The Lord says, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. This commandment tells us two things that if you love something more than, than God, God is jealous and he will not allow that, okay? He'll do something about that. Uh, if you don't know him, he'll visit that iniquity on you. He'll punish you for that sin. If you uh, do know him, then he will discipline you so that he'll get that idol out of your hands. But it also tells you that you are not to worship the true God through images. You're not to worship him in any other way than what he commands. So do you love him? Do you love to worship him? And do you love to worship him the way that he calls you to worship him? Think about that because that's an indicator of how much you love God, how much you love Jesus. When you promise the Lord that you're going to do something, when you make an oath or take a vow, do you do it? In uh, the third commandment, in uh, Exodus 20, verse 7, he says this, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. This really is not directly addressing using God's name as a swear word, although we saw this morning when Paul wrote to the Ephesians that we are not to use coarse language. We're not to speak filthy things. Okay? We're not supposed to drag the holy name of God through the mud and use it as a swear word. But that's not really what he's addressing here. What he's saying is when you call upon God and you make him a promise whether it be in your marriage vows or whether it be in your membership vows, do you keep the words that you have promised to keep or have you simply asked God to bear witness to a lie? Well, let's, let's examine ourselves for a moment, especially those of us who have taken membership vows. Let me just draw your attention to the fourth membership vow. It says this, do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your sovereign Lord? He's king, he's Lord, he calls the shots. And do you promise that in reliance on the grace of God? You will serve him with all that is in you. Forsake the world, resist the devil, put to death your sinful deeds and desires, and lead a godly life. That's a pretty tall order, how you been doing in that? And with regard to number five, I just want to draw your attention to the first one. Do you promise to participate faithfully in this church's worship and service, to submit in the Lord to its government and to heed its discipline, even in case you should be found delinquent in doctrine or life? You know, these two statements encapsulate everything the Lord calls us to do. And these are things that you and I have promised to do. We called God to bear witness as this is what we are intending on doing. So how are you doing? You see, the degree to which you keep these is the, the degree to which you actually love Jesus or don't love Jesus. Do you spend the entire Sabbath day with your Lord? The entire day? Do you keep the whole 24 hours holy to Him in the way He calls you to by setting your work aside, resting and worshiping Him? And do you enjoy doing that? If you had your way, uh, would, would every day be the Sabbath? Or would you reduce the Sabbath down to just maybe one hour, once or twice on the Lord's day? The Lord says in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 10, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You see, to the degree that you keep that or don't keep that, that shows you how much you really love Jesus Christ. So, how are you doing so far? Is your love for the Lord what you thought it was? Could it use some improvement? I think all of us need to improve. But there is more. There's six more commandments. And the rest of them do test your love for God, perhaps a little bit more indirectly, but certainly test your love for your neighbor. How's your relationship with your parents? Do you love them? 
Do you speak about them to others kindly, respectfully? Are you trying to do what they have taught you to do from God's Word? That is, if you had parents that loved the Lord. The Lord says in Exodus 20, verse 12, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you, or as it's updated by Paul in the New Testament, that you may live long, it may go well with you, that you may live long on the earth. Do you love your neighbor, even your enemies? Is there anyone you hate? Is there anyone you want to hurt? Are you doing everything you can to save your neighbor's life by reaching out to them with the gospel? I think all those things are really wrapped up in the sixth commandment. In verse 13, you shall not murder. Remember, the commandments not only tell us what not to do, they also tell us what to do. Don't take away life unjustly, but do everything you can to protect life, your life and the life of your neighbor. And if you were to protect his physical life, how much more his spiritual life? Are you keeping yourselves sexually pure? Are you doing the very best you can to keep impure and lustful thoughts out of your minds, as well as being careful not to inspire those kinds of thoughts in the minds of others? The Lord says in Exodus 20, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Are you careful to make sure that you do not take what does not belong to you? Are you giving your employers the very best work that you can in the hours you're working for them? Now, I think in our day and age, perhaps one of the greatest temptations is the internet with regard to all the pirated stuff that's available, music, movies, literature, just about anything. So let me just put my finger on this one area. Are you careful not to download from the internet anything you don't have a legal right to download? Exodus 20, verse 15, you shall not steal. Do you speak only the truth about others and only in such a way to, that builds them up in the eyes of others rather than tearing them down? Okay, Exodus 20, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, which means that you're to speak the truth, but not in a way that damages your neighbor. Is that what you're doing? And then are you content with what the Lord has given to you? Are you happy when the Lord gives good things to other people? And are you actually happy for them when they're the things that you want, you see, and that you don't have? The Lord says in Exodus 20, verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. By the way, I should have included under the second commandment because this is something we're all tempted to do in the digital age as well. When we're worshiping God, okay, are we focused on the worship of God or are we distracted by other things? You know, when we hear his word expounded, are we surfing the web? Are we, are we texting? We need to be careful. We need to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to be distracted because to the degree that we do, it shows something about our love for Jesus Christ. This is how he speaks to us, isn't it? And so we need to listen to him. If we love him, we will listen to him. So too often, I think, we limit the way that we show our love to Jesus by simply telling him that we love him. But words are cheap, aren't they? It's easy to say things and really not mean them. Or we show our love by reading the Bible, by praying, by singing, rather than showing Him our love in the way that He tells us that He wants us to, which is by obeying everything that He says. There was an example in Scripture of a king who tried to show his regard to God by giving him something that somehow he thought would be pleasing to God when God had actually told him to do something entirely different. And that's when Saul spared the best of the flock in order to sacrifice to God when God told him utterly wipe it all out, destroy it. Well, what did the Lord have to say to him through Samuel? 1 Samuel 15, 22. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. God doesn't want 
the sacrifices that we think he might want. He doesn't want what we choose to give him. What he wants is what he calls us to give him. He wants us to obey rather than sacrifice. That is how we show him love. And so if you want to show Jesus that you love him, do it in the way he tells you to do it rather than in the way you choose to do it. Obey him. Now let me just say in, in closing that here's another very good reason why you should never allow sin in your lives, not even one sin. Because how can you love Jesus? How can you show love to Jesus when you're clearly disobeying him? When you're doing something you know he hates. Is that how you show the people you love that you love him as you, or you love them? As, is that how you show your spouse that you love them as you do something you know they hate? Well, no, of course not. You do what you know they love. Well, what Jesus loves is obedience. Okay? And how can you do what the Lord hates, especially when you consider uh, not only, of course, the command and how he has shown us clearly what it is he would have us to do, but especially when he has shown you so much love to draw your heart out to him. Now that, I would like to, to use that to point us to the table because the table is the reminder that Jesus gives us of his great love for you. And you know, it is, it is funny, isn't it? I mean, it's funny not in, not in the sense that it's humorous, but it is strange. Because, you know, all the things that we're doing here in these worship services can get routine, they can become mundane, but we need to guard our hearts that, that it doesn't become that way. And the Lord's table is one of the things that can, that can do that. We see it so many times, we celebrate it so many times that we really forget what it is that it is showing us. So what is it showing us? What is it that the Lord wants us to see? He wants us to see his love. And that's not something we should easily dismiss because apart from that love, we would be lost. Jesus wants us to remember certain things as we come to the table. He wants us to remember, first of all, that he is God and that he is the one who actually humbled himself to become one with us. He chose to become one with you so that he might obey his Father's commandments for you, so that he might die in your place, that he might be raised again to life for your benefit, that he might actually ascend into heaven and rule over you for your good. And even that he sent his spirit to change your hearts so that you would stop rebelling against him and that you would savingly trust in him. And you know, one day the table reminds us as well that Jesus is going to return for you and to take you where he is so that you might be with him forever. See, that's what the table is to remind you of. And as you think about these things at the table, can you, I mean, as you think about what the table means, can you just easily be distracted from what this, this message is? Can you easily turn away? Can you, can you think about doing anything else when the Lord is trying to remind you of this love? And let me ask you this question. In the face of this much love, can you so easily sin to his face knowing how much he loves you? You see, his love for you and the love that, that you should have for him because of his love for you and because of the Holy Spirit are two very good reasons why you should not allow any room in your life for even one sin. I mean, what does Paul say? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision in, in your life for, for the lust of your flesh. Make no provision for sin, none at all. So let me just ask you this question in closing and again as we prepare to come to the table. Do you allow sin in your life? I mean, do you trade on the grace of God? You say, you know, God's going to forgive me anyway. It's no big deal. Jesus has blotted them all out. I'm on my way to heaven. doesn't matter what I do. Is that how you look at sin? You shouldn't look at sin that way. Jesus died because of his love for you to free you from every single one of those 
sins. That love calls you and calls me to let go of sin, to repent of sin. So do you allow any sin in your life? Jesus loves you. You need to let it go. You need to repent. If you love him, you need to repent of those sins. I know that it's a struggle. I know that we all have sins that beset us, as it were, sins that we particularly have to deal with. But you know what? Jesus will give you the strength to overcome those sins because he loves you. So if you will just look to him for that grace and that strength, he will do it. He will give you that strength. And he will, well, he's already freed you from it, but he will help you put it off. For those of you who are here this evening who don't know him and don't love him, you need to realize you can't let sin go at all without his help. You need to turn to him. You need to ask him to change your hearts. Ask him to turn you to himself. Uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus is merciful, that Jesus is gracious to all who will call upon him. So if you don't know him, if you don't love him at all, if you're not obeying him at all, call on the Lord and ask for his mercy to change your heart and see if the Lord will not give you that grace and that mercy. But again, for those of us who do know him, remember what sin is to Christ. Remember how much he hates it. Remember his love for you. Remember your love for him. And purpose as we come to the table to remember that love and to purpose to put off every single sin from your life. Not only the sins of commission, as it were, the sins of doing things where God says, don't do it, and yet we do it, but also those sins where the Lord says, do this, and we don't do it. Let's uh, spend a few moments in prayer, and let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to... Uh, to help us. We will spend just a few more minutes preparing for the table afterwards, but let's take what we've heard in the sermon and ask that the Lord would apply it.